Hallelujah. And you know what? Because we've got favor, it shouldn't be hard for us to believe God for anything. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. This song says believe for it. So whatever it is that you are believing God for, why don't you just go ahead and release that belief right now? This is a right atmosphere. He moves on your faith. Come on.
you said it, Jesus, we know we can walk in it, God. We can have faith to believe you. Anything and everything, God. We don't place any barriers or boundaries in your way anymore, God. We remove those boundaries. We take the limits off of you, Jesus, because you can do anything. If you can form the earth, and if you can form the waters, and they not overtake us, to go from a seed into a big, large being. You can do anything, God. And so we believe you. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. What's up, Next Level and Level Up? What's up, everyone? We're back with all the scoop. Before we get into the scoop, who enjoyed service last week? I know I did. Pastor Isaac and Pastor Ryan delivered a great message on gratitude. Speaking of gratitude, what are you thankful for, Kelly? I'm thankful that I can be here and worship in the house of the Lord freely. That's good. We all have something to be thankful for. Kelly, we can't forget to recognize a special group of people. You're right, Alicia. Do we have any first time guests in the building today? If so, we want to connect with you. Follow us on Next Level Youth W3 on Instagram and send us a DM with your name and your favorite part of service. We will follow up with you during this week. Thank you for choosing to worship with us and we can't wait to see you during service. Let's get into the scoop. Few students leaders join us for our last meeting this fourth Sunday at 9.30 a.m. Also, lock in two important dates for our Christ giving on December 3rd and our main event celebration on December 11th. We hope to see all of our leaders at both events. Feeling empty? Join us every first Wednesday for a night of worship and encouragement featuring a special guest artist. Also, there will be no youth service on Wednesday, November 26th. It's getting lit. December 31st at 10 p.m., 1K Few is stopping by and performing at Next Level New Year's Eve Bash. You don't want to miss this. And we can't forget to tell them what to wear next week. Crazy socks. Come wearing your favorite pair of crazy socks and bring a pair to donate to our brothers and sisters who are currently living in shelters. That's, That's the, the Scoop, Scoop family. family. Enjoy service. All right, so it's time for the word. Um, we have one of our kingdom servants who's going to bring the word today. Can anybody tell me what we're talking about this month? Gratitude, having an attitude of gratitude. Um, what's something that you've learned from the previous sermons? Somebody want to share? Let me get one person at least. One person from high school to share. What you've learned. Come on, buddy. Y'all give him a hand. Come on, come on, come on. Jackson. What's up, Jackson? Let everybody know your name. I don't already let them know your name, but say your name and what you've learned from this month. Uh, I'm Jackson, and um, I've only been here for one uh, sermon during this, during this, um, during this month. Yeah, during this month. But uh, what I've learned is that there's always something that I can be thankful for. Like, even if it's just like waking up in the morning or having God to talk to you, having friends to talk to, you know, there's always something that I can be thankful for. So um, I can always be joyful in that. And that's what I learned. Praise God. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. There we go. Give thanks in all circumstances. We always have something to give thanks for. So one of our kingdom servants, uh, you've heard him before, so he's no guest. One of our faithful kingdom servants, uh, Mr. Sam, uh, is going to bring us the word today. Y'all give it up for him. All right. So I, I, I want to do something that my, my, my church used to do. I want everybody to point to Mr. Sam and say, Mr. Sam, preach the word. Mr. Sam. Preach the word. Preach the word. All right, God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Sam. Let's go. 
Good morning, Next Level. Good morning. Uh, come on, I know it's cold outside. I'm going to try it again. Good morning, Next Level. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in him. I was glad when they said unto us, let us go into the house of the Lord. And today, this month, we've been talking about an attitude of gratitude. And one of the theme verse that we've had in Psalm 136, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His loving kindness endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. This month, as we've been talking about gratitude, it is so important that you know, gratitude is the at attitude that will set your altitude to a higher level. Gratitude is the out attitude that would set your altitude to a higher level. And it's unfortunate because so many times we receive things and we are not grateful. I was reminded about this story that I read this week about this young man. His name was Edward Spencer. He was a university student. And one day, many, many years ago, there was this ship by the name of Lady Elgin. And this ship started to sink, and it sank in Lake Michigan. Now, anybody who knows about Lake Michigan knows that it can be very cold in the winter. So as the ship sank, there were people on the ship. And this university student, he was an exceptional swimmer. He knew how to swim well, and he did not even think about his own life. He jumped in the water, and he started saving people and he saved 17 people he risked his life to save 17 people but unfortunately he did take a risk because when he took that risk years later he developed some health complication and it was years years later he was sitting in an interview and he was looking back and somebody said did anybody of the 17 people that you saved did any of them ever reach out to say thank you and he said, no, not one of them did. And you know me, I can be like, man, the audacity, the nerve, the gall of these people. They should have tried. And this man, all they could have said was thank you. And not one of them said thank you. But before I point fingers at those 17 people, I need to point fingers at myself. Because how many times just this week... The Lord convicted me because, I, you know, I got an older car and sometimes it's not always working right. So, you know, every once in a while, I'm like, Lord, please make sure I get from point A to point B or whatever. And it was interesting because uh, my wife had this dream and she was like, man, I feel like we really need to be praying in terms of like she just had this real bad dream about like us getting in an accident. So that morning I was like, Lord, please protect us as we on the road. And it was like the next day. And I was like, man, it's so easy for me to ask ask God for things and I never go back and say thank you when he did it because that day he woke me up got me on the road I made it safe to my destination made it safe home and I just took it for granted without even saying thank you it is so important that you learn to say thank you gratitude is the attitude that would set the altitude for your life I am reminded that Gratitude to God can change everything. And today we're going to look at a passage, but before we look at this passage, it is weird because even if you're not a Christian, gratitude is so important. Years ago, there was this guy, Mr. John, and Mr. John was in a dark, dark place. He was 53 years old. It was a cold December day. He was in this tight little apartment. And not only was he in this tight little apartment, during the winter, he was freezing to death. And then during the summer, he was baking in the apartment. I mean, Mr. John was looking over his life. He was like, how did my life end up like this? 
In the process, he was going through a bitter divorce, a painful divorce with his second wife. This was his second marriage that had failed. Not only had his marriage failed, but also he was dealing with, he had two children and he did not have a good relationship with them. In fact, one of them, his youngest daughter, was, in, was on the verge of not even talking to him. He had dream, he had aspiration of being a judge, but now he's looking at his life and his dream is slipping away and he's like, how did I end up like this? I'm in this tight little apartment I'm divorced again he had a girlfriend the girlfriend broke up with him and he's sitting there he's miserable he's 40 pound overweight and he's looking how miserable his life is this was in December on New Year's Day he went for a walk and while he's walking he's like man I wonder what it would be if I started focusing, stop focusing on what I don't have and start focusing on what I do have. So he made up in his mind. He said for the new year, every single day, he gonna take some time to write a note of encouragement, to write a thank you to either a friend, a family member, a colleague, or somebody. He made up in his mind that he would do that. And it was crazy because years ago, this guy was on CBS. You can look him up. And he's giving this interview after he did a whole year. And it even take a whole year as he started being faithful to every day for him to take some time and just to say thank you and his life started changing I don't even know if he's a Christian or not but I do know there is power in gratitude how much more for us as Christian who know Jesus Christ how much more is it important for us to be grateful Gratitude can change everything. But I'm here to tell you, it's not only gratitude can change everything, but gratitude to God changes everything. Today, as we look at the scripture, we're gonna look at, if you can open your Bible, to Luke chapter 17, verse 11 to 19. I'm getting old, so I can't always see. So I need to put these glasses on. Luke chapter 17, verse 11 to 19. While traveling to Jerusalem, he passed between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered the village, 10 men with leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and raised their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he told them, go and show yourself to the priests. And while they were going, they were cleansed. But one of them, seeing that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice gave glory to God. He fell face down at his feet, thanking him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus said, were not 10 cleansed? Where are the nine? Didn't any return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he told him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has saved you. Heavenly Father, as we come today, hide me behind the cross. I have nothing to say to your people. But your word is so powerful that it can meet each and every one of us at the point of our need. Your word is so powerful, God, that your word doesn't only come for information, but it comes to transform us into the likeness of the image of Christ. Your word is so powerful. It said in the beginning, God, you created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And your word brought everything into existence that is. That's how powerful your word is. Your word can raise the dead. Your word can quicken life. Your word can turn our lives around. So God, I pray today that you would speak to each and every person. We come against any spirit of distraction, any spirit that would cause people not to pay attention, any spirit that would cause people to fall asleep, that would cause people to be deceived. In the name of Jesus, we take the authority but that you have given us and we cast those spirits out and we ask that each and every person will be attentive and that we will not only only be hearers of the word but that we will be doers of the word so that you would receive the glory we thank you and we praise you we give you all the glory all the honor in jesus precious name we pray this prayer amen before i proceed i quickly realized 
I'm trying to preach a message and I almost forget to follow what I'm preaching. Like, I should never take it for granted that God has provided me the opportunity to speak. So I want to say thank you, God, for just even the fact that I am here this morning. I thank him because I did not have to be here. It's his grace that allows me to be here. I'm so grateful to Pastor Evan, Dr. Evans, and I'm so grateful to Pastor Jay, Jonathan Evans, the youth staff, the youth volunteers, my co-laborers, and I'm thankful for each and every one of y'all because honestly, y'all could have been home at Bedside Baptist talking to Deacon Pillow and just chilling, but y'all did not see it was robbery that y'all decided, hey, I'm going to come to church and I'm going to come and praise God. So thank you for coming today and being here. Amen. Let's clap it up for y'all. So clap it up for Jesus. So today, as we look at a very familiar passage in Luke chapter 17, starting verse 11, it says, when Jesus, while traveling in Jerusalem, he passed between Samaria and Galilee. Immediately, this is important because there is no word in the Bible that's just there by accident. That just is a, you know, a coincidence. Every word that God has there is for a specific reason. While he was traveling to Jerusalem, that means that he is going to Jerusalem. And this is important because in Luke chapter 9, it says that when the time had arrived for Jesus to go back where he came from, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. See, to me, that already speaking to me because that tells me that Jesus was a man on a mission, a man with the message. He had a plan. He knew the plan that God had for him. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, that is the start of the last few months of Jesus' life, and he is traveling to Jerusalem because he knows that he is headed to the cross. Oh, what power there is when you know that you have purpose. Oh, what power there is when you know that you are not here by the, a, a accident, that you're not by here by coincidence, but there is divine purpose to your life. And you are not an accident, you are not a coincidence, but God placed you here for a reason, and there is something that God want to accomplish in your life. Jesus knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I know why I came here. I know what God going to do in and through me, and he made up in his mind while he is traveling to Jerusalem, the last few months of his life. And this is crazy because he knew what was going to happen to him. When he got to Jerusalem, he was going to be beaten. He was going to be betrayed. He was going to be bruised. He was going to be crucified. He was going to be spit on. But he still made up in his mind that I'm going to follow God and I'm not turning back. I know what's ahead of me. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be, it, 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 there will be a lot of challenges. But if this is what God wants for my life, I will accomplish. Shit. I wish there was some young person who knew I'm not here by accident, I'm not here by coincidence, but I know there is purpose to my life and I am following God no matter what. While he was traveling between to, uh, to Jerusalem, and it says that he passed between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a village, 10 men with leprosy. So not only is Jesus a man on a mission, he has a plan, he has a purpose, he know where he's going. But I thank God that even though he has a mission, he's never too busy to take time for me. Because even though he's traveling and he's going to Jerusalem, he know what is awaiting him. It seemed like he just stopped by this village. And when he stopped, there are 10 lepers. And this is so important because the first thing we want to look at is the condition of the lepers. So when we look at them, it says that as he entered a village, so he was not even in the village, on the outside of the village. So the first thing I want you to think about in terms of the condition of the lepers, they were not even allowed to be in the village. They are on the outside. They are outsiders. They are on the outskirt. Because they had a condition called leprosy. When you think about leprosy, they talk about leprosy in Leviticus chapter 13 and chapter 14. Leviticus chapter 13 and chapter 14, when you talk about lep leprosy, it was a skin disease. 
And if you had that skin disease, you were toe up from the flow up. Because the reason why you was toe up from the flow up is because nobody wanted to deal with you. Imagine you got these big sores. Imagine that you are smelling. Imagine eventually your, your, your fingers and your toes, they start being a part, a going back into your body. Your bone become fragile. Your eyes, some of them lost their teeth. Some of them lost their voice. See, all that is bad physically. I mean, imagine if you look grotesque and nobody want to deal with you. It's one thing to look bad. It's another thing for you to be dealing with emotional loneliness. Nobody want to deal with you. It was so bad. You had to be on the outside of the city, but then you had to go around. And whenever you was coming around, you had to say, unclean, unclean. And you are warning people, get away from me. So imagine if you develop this disease and you had a family. You can't be around your wife. You can't be around your husband. You can't be around your children. You done lost your job. You got no money. You got no hope. You got no family. Just imagine how desperate that situation is to be in a situation where you got absolutely nothing. Condition was bad. It was so bad, you can't even be in the city. But to me, one thing that's interesting about them is there was 10 of them. So that means even when you are in a bad situation, it's important about the company that you keep. This past week, my heart was so broken. And I don't know all the details. It was a story that I read uh, on the, like I, read, I was reading the news and I saw this story. There was this one girl, I think she went to Cabo, Mexico with like, you know, four or five friends or whatever. And when she went to Mexico, you know, the mom, she had just spoken to her mom, everything was going well. The next day, the mom received a call, hey, you know, your daughter's not doing well, I think she has alcohol poisoning, I think she's not doing well. So then it was like, the girl died. Imagine if you're a mom, you, you, you got your daughter, and this is why it broke my heart, because I got kids now. And not only I got kids, I got a son sometime, he's only five years old, but he's always trying to be friend with people, and I'm keep on telling you, you need to be a leader. If somebody don't wanna be your friend, don't be crying about them, let, let, let it be, you know, you got to be strong. So I'm like, man, you got to be careful about the friends that you have. So as I'm reading this story, and I'm like, man, this girl, so they tell the mom that she dies of alcohol poisoning, the mom is like, man, her heart is broken. But then eventually they do an autopsy. And when they do the autopsy, they find that she had a broken spinal cord and a, spine, and a neck, like a broken neck. And not only that, eventually they say that there's a video that's out there where one of the friends is beating her up. Like just beating her up. And I'm like, man, like these were your friends? Sometimes, some of us, the friends that we have, they worse than enemies because they act one way, but they gonna take you down. These people, like, and we gonna see very soon, to me, they are in a desperate situation, but at least they got friends that gonna point them to Jesus. So you're fortunate that you get a chance to come to a church like OCBF. There's opportunity for you to develop relationship. But I'm here to tell you, it is so important, the friends that you keep. Because some of us, whether it's a boyfriend, whether it's uh, your, one of your, your ride or die chick, there are, pla there are places God wants to take you. And because of the people that you're hanging around, you're about to abort God's purposes in your life. So we get these friends, these 10 lepers, we see their position. First of all, they are outside of the city. Not only are they outside of the city, but then it says that they started yelling because they could not get close to Jesus. So they started yelling and they started saying, have, Master Jesus, have mercy on me. Their condition is bad, but even though their condition is bad, at least they're in a community and the community recognized there is a need for Jesus. At this age, I know life looks so good. 
and everything looks so peachy, but I'm here to tell you the best decision you can make is fully surrendering your life to Christ. The best decision. Before your life get jacked up, before your life look like what in the world happened, be serious about your relationship with Christ. It goes on to say, As he entered a village, 10 men with leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. They stood at a distance because they could not come near him. And they raised their voice because they was at a distance. They have to yell. And they say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. This is so critical because at least these lepers realized the situation that they were in, that they realized they had a need for a savior. Do you know that sometime you can be in dysfunction so long that it become, the dysfunction become normal? All right, let me say that again. Sometime you can be in dysfunction so long, dysfunction become normal, that you don't even see a need to change. Okay, I just, I, it just might be me. And this, this, this is about, this is a little personal, so don't, don't judge me, don't, don't, don't critique me, don't talk about me. God is still working on me. But have you ever used the bathroom to do a number two and you like, who died in the bathroom? <laughs> See, that happened to me. But, 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 listen, listen, I love to eat, and I, my, I got friends that are telling me I need to go vegan, I need to go, you know, vegetarian, stop eating all that barbecue, so don't judge me, you know? My wife was like, bro, you can't go, you, you know, bro, you need to lose weight, so don't judge me. But you know what's the problem? If you stay in the bathroom long enough, you become used to the bad smell. And at some point, the bad smell don't even bother you. Yeah. Yeah. There was one time, you know, I'm taking my time, I'm reading. Eventually, it doesn't even bother me. But then when I finished, then I wash my hand, go out, and then I walk by the bathroom and I was like, O-M-G. <laughs> Some of us, we've been in dysfunction so long that the dysfunction become normal and we don't even realize that we need, some of us, we are in a relationship, used to say, I will never let somebody hit on me. I will never let somebody dog me like that. I will never let somebody, and guess what now? They doing it to you and you can't even get out. I will never, I will never. Be careful when your dysfunction becomes so normal, you don't even feel the need for help. I like these 10 lepers because even though they are in a crazy situation, they are in a hopeless situation, they seem to be in a helpless situation, they are outcasts, they are outsiders, nobody's paying, they don't even know if they will ever be cured. It looks like this is how their whole life will go, their whole life will go in a mess, but they still have the common sense to say, I done heard about a man, I done heard about a man, I done heard about Jesus, and I know that Jesus is able and they cry out have Jesus master have mercy on me so first we talk about the condition of the lepers then we talk about the cry the call of the lepers and I pray and, and the reason why I talked about the dysfunction a little bit is if you're not careful the devil will blind you to your sin that you while you are in it you don't even see how bad it is you don't even think about the consequences and then all of a sudden all of a sudden all of a sudden one day you wake up and you like how in the world did I get here and you look at yourself in the mirror and you hate the person that you see and you about to kill yourself because the devil have pulled the okie doke on you and you do not realize Sin will take you further than you're willing to go. It will keep you longer than you're willing to stay. It will cost you more than you're willing to pay. 
So we see that here we have these people. There's a condition, but not only is there a condition, there's a cry. And because there's a cry, there's a command. And the command, Jesus tells them, Jesus says, Go to the priest. Now, this is so interesting because when you look at Leviticus chapter 13 and 14, the priests were like the health inspectors. They were the one who was able to say if you're clean or unclean. These people still have leprosy. They have not been healed. And Jesus said, go to the priest. At this point, this is where faith comes in because Jesus, you said it. I believe it. That settles it even when I don't see it. I love coming to this church because there's a great pastor, Dr. Evan, and he say faith is acting like it is so, even when it's not so, so that it might be so, because God said so. Faith is acting like it is so, even when it's not so, so that it might be so, because God said so. God said, go to the priest. Just, I mean, imagine this. I don't know how long it's been, but you've been the outcast. You looking toe up from the flow up. Your limbs are starting to shrivel. They're starting to shrink. And this man have the audacity to tell me to go to the priest. Now in Luke chapter five, there was a man who had leprosy. He touched him and he healed him. Jesus don't even touch. He just said, go to the priest. And when he said, go to the priest, this is so interesting because at that point, there is a decision to be made. Either I'm going to take God at his word and start moving or I'm going to start saying, God, but, uh, but Jesus, like I, I still got leprosy. Jesus, I can't go to the priest because only people who are clean who are pure. I mean, Jesus, and if you are Samaritan, you can't even go into the holies of holy. So Jesus, you're not making sense. And a lot of time we try to rationalize. We try to figure out. We try to argue with God instead of just obey God. You may not understand what God is saying. It may not make sense to you. You may be alone, but you got to obey God. Faith requires that your action. It requires that you walk. You don't just talk. We talk so much about faith. We talk so much about loving God, but at the end of the day when God tell you to do something are you willing to obey are you willing to obey are you willing to obey Amen. there's a condition but they don't stay in their dysfunction there's a cry and when they cry and they call to the Lord God give them instruction a command go to the priest and as they are going, as they are walking, what has God told you to do that you have all kinds of excuse and you're not doing it? Because some things will only happen when you take that step. Talk about, hey, Joshua, come here. Tell me a little bit about God tell you to cross the Jordan River. And there's a mighty water rushing back and forth. And it's like, how do I get across there? But as soon as the priests put their feet on the water, it's, it's separated. If you a person who God have to explain everything before you take a step, you're not going to get everything that God has for you. That's why faith is so important. Even when I don't see it, if God said it, I believe it, and I'm going to walk accordingly. As they are going, God give a command, they start walking, they go, and as they go, all of a sudden, whoa, I'm healed. I am healed. And not only are they healed, even though they are healed, only one of them decide to come back. And he says, go, verse 14, when he saw them, he told them, go and show yourself to the priest. And while they were going, while they were going, as they were walking, they were cleansed. But one of them, seeing that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice, he gave glory to God. He fell face down at his feet, thanking him, and he was a Samaritan. So they start going. And right now, there is one of them, as he is going, he see that he's healed. He's like, man, I got to go back. I got to go back and I got to go and say thank you. I got to go back. 
And I'm just praying for us as Christian that we become people who have an attitude of gratitude that you don't take God for granted and you always, always, every time God do stuff, big or small, you say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because thankfulness is the soil that will help faith to flourish. Thankfulness is the soil that will help faith to flourish. When you are constantly thanking God, it makes you see a bigger picture of God. You don't just focus on your situation or your circumstance, but you see God for who he is. This man comes back and it says that as he came back, he returned with a loud voice. He gave glory to God. He fell face down, thanking God. And then it goes and says he's a Samaritan. So there were Jews there. And what is so interesting is that with the Jews that were there, it's so easy to say, God, give me this. God, give me that. God, give me this. God, give me this. And you never really worship God for who he is. See, sometimes I wonder, all those people that Jesus healed, all those people that Jesus fed, and now Jesus is about to be crucified, where are all those people? Because it's so easy, Sam, sometimes to think God is a magic genie, and God, give me this, God, give me that, God, give me this, God, I'm mad at you because you didn't do this, God, I'm mad at you, but God doesn't exist for me. He's God all by himself. He returned with a loud voice. He glorified God. He kneeled, a posture of worship, and he thanked God. And when he did that, God, Christ gave him a commendation. He asked three rhetorical questions. Where are the, where, you know, how many people did I heal? Did I not heal nine of them? Where are they? And Jesus said, your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. This Thanksgiving, I know sometimes, and it, I, I, I encourage you to be thankful for everything. We had a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Isaac preached, and he talked about, you know, in 1 Thessalonians, and say, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything, give thanks to God. And this week when I was thinking, so many times we thank God for what he gives us, but sometimes we just need to thank God for who he is. And as I was uh, listening to this uh, sermon, I mean, this sermon really, like, just had me want to shout. And I want you to, as I read this, I want you to kind of think, about this this guy S.M. Lockridge he's a pastor he passed away a while ago but he had this sermon called, uh, that he preached called Amen and there's this part of the sermon that says the Bible says he's the king of the Jews he's the king of Israel he's the king of righteousness he's the king of the ages he's the king of heaven he's the king of glory he's the king of kings and he's lord of lord now that's my king David says the heaven declared the glory of God and the firmament showed his handiwork no means of measure can define his limitless love no far seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply no barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing he's enduringly strong he's entirely sincere he's eternally steadfast he's immortally grateful he's imperatively powerful he's and partially merciful. That's my king. That's my king. He's God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's standalone in himself. He's august. He's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine in true theology. He's the cardinal necessity a spiritual religion. That's my king. That's my king. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. He's the only one able to supply all our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength to the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes
baptizes and he saves. He guards and he dies. He heals the sick. He cleanses the leper. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aid. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meat. Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him? My king is the key of knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. The master of the mighty. The captain of the conquerors. The head of the hero. The leader of the legislator. The overseer of the overcomer. The governor of the governors. The prince of peace. The king of kings. And the lord of lords. That's my king. That's my king. That's my king. His office is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changed. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him. I wish I could describe him. He's indescribable. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you. The heaven of heaven cannot contain him. Let alone a man try to explain him. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hand. You can't outlive him. And you can't live without him. The fact Pharisees couldn't stand them, but they found out that they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimony to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave could not hold him. That's my king. That's my king. He always has been, and he will always be. I'm talking about he had no predecessor. He will have no successor. There was nobody before him. There'll be nobody after him. You can't impeach him, and he's not going to resign. That's my king. That's my king. That's my king. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The glory is all his. Thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever and ever and ever. And when you get through with all the evers, amen. That's the king that you're serving. Listen. It is so important give God thanks for what he has done. But I'm going to tell you, if you keep on sleeping and you keep on waking up, every day not going to be easy. And Isaac already preached and everything give thanks. Someday you may not have a reason to give thanks based on your circumstance. But you can always give God thanks because of he, who he is. In Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about be spirit-filled. Do not become drunk with wine and, you know, dissipation, but be spirit-filled. Singing psalms, singing hymns, giving thanks to God. For some of us this morning, God is saying, you ungrateful, you are ingrate for all that I've done for you. You thinking everybody else and you never take the time to thank me. Some of us need to repent and say, God, forgive us for being ungrateful. So some of us need to say thanks. But some of us, we're going through the craziest time in our lives. And God is saying, you need to look up. You need to see me for who I am. Don't only want things coming out of my hand, but trust my heart that I am sovereign. I know the plans that I have for you. I know right now you may be in a dark season, but I'm telling you, I am still God of the good days and the bad days. On your worst day, you are still a child of God, and I still got a plan for you. And don't let the devil bamboozle you. Don't let the devil trick you. Don't let the devil make you want to kill yourself, because I'm still not done with you yet. If I was one of those 10 lepers, I would have been like, man, let me just go and throw myself a pity party. My life is over. My life will never be. God is still in the business of saying, hey, listen to me who will walk by faith and for some of us we have the desire to 
say thank you, but you're trying to do it on your own. That's why that last verse that I said is so important. In Ephesians 5, it say be spirit filled because so many times we as preachers can say, hey, do this, do that. But do you know apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, you cannot do anything on your own? You were spiritually dead. That means you do not have it in you to do it. And sometimes we put the weight on people saying, do this, do that, do this. And people are struggling because they're like, I try to do it, but I can't do it. And they're trying to do it on their own strength. Some of us need to say, God, I need to tap into your power of your spirit to change my life. Because when you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, God will do stuff in your life that you never even thought or imagined he can do. This guy did not just receive physical healing. But the word that they use, some of the translations say, you will be made whole, you will be made well. But in Greek is the word sozo, which goes with salvation. So as we wrap up today, whew, I'm looking forward to that collard green, candy yam, cornbread. And then I'm going to stink up the bathroom. No, 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 that's too much information. That's too much information. But as we are celebrating God's goodness, we want to take some time. First and foremost, right where you at, you just might say, God, I need to repent because honestly, God, I have not had a thankful spirit. I'm always complaining about something. I'm always seeing the worst in things, seeing the worst in people, and I'm just like, everything is like this. Years ago, they had that movie where like, bah, eh. yeah, and that's what complaining. Eh, eh, eh. It's just like constantly complaining about everything. And for some of us, we need a heart trans tra transformation. So some of us, we just need to repent and say, Heavenly Father, forgive me for my lack of gratitude. Forgive me, God, for not being thankful. God, I don't know if John Kralik is a believer or not, but if the world, worldly people can say there is power in gratitude, how much more for Christians to say? Because we got so much to be grateful for. So God, right now, I pray, God, there are those of us in the room that just need to say, God, Help me to be grateful. Help me to see you in every situation, every circumstance, to see your hand, to know that I'm your child, that you have not abandoned me, you have not left me, and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, that I can be able to say like Job, the Lord give it, the Lord take it, blessed be the name of the Lord. I have been young, and I have been old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging for bread. Lord, open my spiritual eyes to see you as you long for me to see you, to hunger and thirst for you. Yes, God, there's so much that you can give me, but most importantly, I want you. You can heal me, thank you, but I want you. You can provide food for me and you will take care of me, but God, I want you. I want your presence, God. I want your power. I want you, God. Fill these young people with your spirit. Because if you, God, if you don't move in our lives, God, we'll go through the motion, but we will never be all that you have called us to be. So God, give us a heart of gratitude. Some of us, God, are going through such a difficult season, and it's hard to say thank you. We see everybody celebrating, but we probably lost our mom, lost our dad, lost a grandma, lost a loved one. Financially, money's acting funny. The change is strange and things are just going crazy. And God, honestly, some of us feel like we have no reason to thank you. But God, our circumstances don't dictate whether you God or not. You can't be impeached and you won't resign. You are king. You sit on the throne and you look high and low. And I pray, God, that you would just comfort, that you would encourage, that you would strengthen, that you would help those right now, God, who are going through a season of difficulty, God, to know, to know, to know, to know. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord God Almighty, he is the creator of heaven and earth. Help us to know what we know in our good days that we remember in our bad days. Job was able to say, I know my Redeemer lives. God, 
God is still on the throne even when life is crazy. So encourage, strengthen. But more importantly, God, there are some of us who don't even know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We're going through the routine. We constantly want things from God, but we've never said, Master, Lord, we surrender. Withholding nothing, we surrender everything. Life can be so crazy, but God, you are good. I pray that this Thanksgiving will be different. For some of us, we will start the journey of just every day by the power of your spirit to find one thing to be thankful and to write it down. No matter what craziness we had in our day, to just be thankful. And God, we need your spirit. Fill us up, fill us up, fill us up with your Holy Spirit so we can be who you call us to be. We can do what you call us to do. We can have what you call us to have. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. We exalt you. We magnify you. You are good. You are great. You are greatly to be praised. There is no God like our God. Who is like our God? Who loved us while we were yet sinners? While we were dead in sin? While we were dead in our trespasses? God, you loved us. Even when our friends, even when our mom, even when other people, if they really knew, if they really knew all the gory detail and knew how grotesque our life was, they would run away from us. But God, while we were yet in sin, he who knew no sin became sin so that we may have life and life abundantly. God, break every chain, every demonic, every satanic, every stronghold in the mind, every stronghold in our thought, every stronghold, God, even past relationship, even things that are holding us captive and set us free whom the Son has set free is free indeed. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, the truth shall set you free. Break every chain, break every spirit, every demonic, everything that would hold us, God, from truly, truly having an attitude of gratitude. Thank you. We praise you. We exalt you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Well, hello, and thank you for tuning in to our Next Level Youth online services. My name is Isaac Shepard. You can find more youth content on our Facebook and Instagram at Next Level Youth W3. Also, don't forget to tune in to Dr. Tony Evans every Sunday at 11 a.m. on our OCBF Church Facebook and YouTube. Thank you and God bless you.